The Lord be with you. In case it is not otherwise obvious, I belong to the generation that still believes in the importance of reading the daily newspaper. Oh, I check the websites of various papers from time to time, the one in Dallas, as well as national ones from Washington and New York, and occasionally international ones from London or Manchester. But my day does not have a proper start unless it involves walking out onto the front lawn, shaking the morning dew off the plastic wrapper, and unfolding the paper and its ink on the kitchen table. Usually I start with discovering who won and who lost. That includes the sports section, of course, where the outcomes of the overnight professional college and high school games are reported, but it also includes the front section, the main section, where I can read reports and editorials to advise me which of the politicians seem to be winning or losing in their ceaseless efforts to appear busy while they are accomplishing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and then I turn to the second section, which has, among other items, the obituaries of the famous and the unfamiliar. Did you ever notice how often the language of losing appears in the obituary section? Someone lost his life in an auto accident. Someone else lost her long battle with cancer. As a cancer patient myself, I can tell you I'm looking for another way to describe the situation besides the term losing when it comes to dying. I need another metaphor besides warfare to describe living with or dying from disease or disaster. Ultimately, it is a war none of us will win. Perhaps someday there'll be a cure for all cancers. Perhaps someday all vehicles will be perfectly and completely safe and secure. Perhaps one day all homicides will cease. But we will all die. If we keep talking in terms of saving lives or losing them to death, we'll miss the fact that human life has a finite path to travel on earth. For each of us, life on earth will come to an end. The question for Christians is this. When it ends, will it end in defeat or victory? For the people who are at the center of tonight's text from the book of Revelation, the question was more than a matter of biological existence. The book of Revelation comes from that period early in the history of Christianity, perhaps 60 or 70 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, when Christianity was an illegal religion in the Roman Empire. Making one's commitment to faith it was not a matter of standing in front of a congregation to shake hands with a preacher or signing a pledge card that commits us to donate funds, to offer prayers, to give time, to attend worship. The book of Revelation was written because Christians at the close of the first century were facing political persecution. They were facing unwanted arrest. They were facing uncounted periods of incarceration. They were facing, quite possibly, a violent death in a public stadium that was orchestrated for the sheer amusement of the populace and the princes. In the words of Revelation, believers had to endure what was called the great ordeal. It was a time of terrible testing. It was an age of punishing persecution. On a daily basis, Christians had to wonder whether their faith or their lives would end in defeat or victory. The book of Revelation offers a vision that sees beyond the great ordeal. In fact, one New Testament scholar says that the author of the book of Revelation 
vaults himself so far forward as to be looking beyond the end of time. The author is known to us as St. John the Divine. He views a scene of serenity and singing, sheltered by the Lord and sated by the springs of life. And anybody who weeps will find that God is a tender caregiver who wipes away every tear, even the tears of joy at this magnificent and mysterious victory. Well, let's talk about that word victory for a moment. The Greek word behind it is the word soteria, which is usually translated salvation. But for a lot of Christians in our time, the word salvation has a rather peculiar and precise meaning that can miss the message that appears in this text from the book of Revelation. In this passage, many scholars say a better translation for the word soteria is actually the word victory. A reading tonight in chapter 7, verse 9, describes an immense crowd, a crowd so huge that it cannot be counted, a crowd so diverse that its constituents come from every tribe and nation and ethnic group and language preference on earth. All of these people with all of their differing characteristics of race and tongue are standing before the throne of the Lord, wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They are celebrating their soteria, their salvation, their victory. The white robes they wear, the palm branches they wave, are what ancient athletes and warriors were wearing when treated to triumphant celebrations of victories. There was even a statue that the ancient Greeks used to honor the victories. Its name, unsurprisingly, was Victory. Well, that's really the English translation of the name. In Greek, the name is Nike. Nike. Well, that's the Greek pronunciation. We pronounce it with a swoosh, Nike. <laughs> but in tonight's passage from the book of Revelation, victory does not belong to an athlete or a warrior, let alone a statue. Victory belongs to a community of believers, just as it was promised in ancient days to Abraham and all of his descendants. Victory belongs to the family of the faithful. Victory is their triumphant passage through persecution. It is, says New Testament scholar G.B. Caird, the victory of faith over all that can seduce and contaminate faith. The martyrs, the martyrs, you heard them musically in the prelude tonight, the martyrs who have borne witness to the truth of the faith, in some cases even even to the fact of facing death. The martyrs have conquered and won the victory. That's why I'm so suspicious of using the word losing when it comes to matters of faith and death. Only through the vision of eternity can we actually see who gets to celebrate the victory. Only through the light of eternity can we see beyond death. Last evening, I told you about one of our graduates, a woman from Zimbabwe. She has now managed to keep herself and her two surviving children out of that country, and they plan to stay out. Her son has earned his college degree, and he's now completing a PhD in engineering at one university in the United States. Her daughter graduated from college summa cum laude in pre-med studies and is now on her way to medical school. And our graduate is now an ordained United Methodist minister, a member of the Zimbabwe conference. But she cannot go home again. Last week, she visited with me in my office. And she told me that her mother had died back home in Zimbabwe in 2011. 
She said she truly wanted to visit her mother in her dying days, and she certainly wanted to be there for the funeral. But the family members warned her not even to try. They told her that the authorities had her home, their home, under surveillance. If she tried to return to see her dying mother or to attend the funeral, she would surely have been detained and probably would have been one of the disappeared who was lost in the custody of the authorities. As long as that government is in power, she cannot go home again. So she has sought and now has received asylum from the government of the United States. She and her children are safe here. What the book of Revelation offers her is an assurance that those who seek her silence, who seek her to be quiet, who want her to stop singing and speaking and will do it if it requires putting her to death, she now knows that there is an assurance in the book of Revelation that her silence will not occur because she will triumph. She belongs to a community that will do more than win a victory in eternity. She believes in a victory that reaches from heaven right down to earth and offers a taste of triumph here and now. A vision of saints wearing white robes and waving palm branches is not a fantasy. It's a living hope and a certain promise, giving confidence and joy to those who come through the great ordeal and that they will celebrate a victory. That image may be a little hard to fathom for those of us who, stuck, who are stuck on a particular notion of victory. How do you calculate a victory? Well, it involves more than winning a sporting event or surviving an illness. Those of us who are addicted to sports, and I count myself among them, may have a hard time seeing the essence of the spiritual victory. The nice thing about a football or basketball or soccer game is that we have a very clear sense of the outcome. When the allowed time ends, the one with the most points wins. In tennis, the victor is the one who makes the final point. In golf, the victor is the one who takes the fewest strokes. In baseball, the victor is the one who gets the last out. A game ends and one side is victorious. But look beyond sports outcomes to see all the different ways that we count victories. You can look at sports, just look beyond sports outcomes. Like this. If a quarterback on a football team completes only 65% of his passes, remember what 65% was when you were in school? D. If a quarterback completes only 65% of his passes, or to put it in reverse, if a quarterback fails 35% of the time to complete a pass. He's probably good enough to lead his team to the Super Bowl. The Dallas Cowboys would love to have him. His name would be in the ring of honor. If a baseball player fails to get a hit two-thirds of the times that he stands at the plate, the chances are not only that the team will go to the World Series, but also that the player himself will have a plaque in Cooperstown. If a candidate for the presidency of the United States fails to get nearly half of the votes of the American voters, odds are that she or he will have enough electoral votes to move into the White House. To win a victory in sports or politics, one only has to succeed a fraction of the time. But if a neurosurgeon successfully performs operations 999 times and fails to get the patient safely through surgery in the thousandth operation, the patient may be paralyzed. 
and the doctor may lose his license. If a commercial airline pilot makes safe landings 999 times, but she fails to land her aircraft just one time in the thousandth flight, she may not only lose her license, but also her life and the lives of her passengers and crew. There are lots of different ways to count whether something is a defeat or a victory. In the book of Revelation, it is a victory if all of the diverse community of Christians who are believers trust in the triumph of Christ on the cross and remain true to the faith while enduring the ordeals through which we pass as they press themselves upon us. In the book of Revelation, salvation or victory is a communal experience when we gather with all those who have suffered great ordeals, who have been persecuted unjustly, who've been deprived of life and peace. In the book of Revelation, that's the vision of heaven when we're all there together. The victory isn't counted in terms of how many of us get to heaven. The Bible says, in fact, such numbers cannot be counted. The victory is that the collected community gathers together with all of the boundaries broken, the boundaries of race and class and culture and language broken. The community gathers in triumphant celebration over those who thought their prestige or power in the world was greater than the peace of God. It's going to be a surprising victory for some who thought that they had the truth or that they held the power. One of the congregations I served as a pastor was in a community where there was a very large and active charismatic fellowship in town. The members of the charismatic fellowship who came from a lot of the congregations and parishes were deeply committed to the faith, but they self-righteously believed that their styles of worship and discipleship were the only true way to praise God and serve God. One of the members of the United Methodist Church that I served said to me one day, I can't wait to get to heaven and see all my charismatic friends. They're going to be so surprised at who else got in. <laughs> Here's the amazing thing. We don't have to wait. We can get beyond all those boundaries and begin tasting the victory right now, right here, right away. When the Methodist Church was formed in 1939 by the reunion of the northern and southern branches of Methodism that had split over slavery a hundred years earlier, the decision to reunite was accompanied by a decision to divide the church in a different way. We divided it by race. Black and white Methodists were organized into entirely separate structures. It was a choice to conform the church to the segregated patterns of society. It was a concession to the political correctness of the age that was instituted from the perspective of those white leaders who held the power. That was 1939. Twelve years later, when a new theology quadrangle was under construction on the southwest corner of the Southern Methodist University campus. The campus was being physically transformed by that construction project. New chapel, new library, two new office and classroom buildings, four residence halls. But while all of that was happening visibly and on the surface of the campus, Something else was underway that was underneath the surface. Because while the construction project to transform the campus had begun, a small group of leaders had begun to transform the university in quite another way. Then President Humphrey Lee, then theology dean Merriman Cunningham, and a few trustees, including a man named Joe Perkins, developed a plan 
to desegregate Southern Methodist University. For the first time in the history of the institution, black students would be admitted to degree programs at SMU in the fall of 1952. 1952. That's two years before the Supreme Court said in Brown versus Board of Education, public schools must desegregate. It was 10 years before the Voting Rights Act ended the legal segregation at the ballot box. It was 16 years before Methodists officially ended the segregation of our denomination. It happened because a few courageous people perhaps because they glimpsed a vision of the people of God beyond the politically correct systems of the day, ended racial segregation at Southern Methodist University. And yet the experiment almost failed. Because as the end of the first year of that entering class at Perkins School of Theology was drawing to its conclusion, Two of the students at Perkins decided they'd be roommates in the residence halls the next year. One white student, one black student. And the critics began to pour out. I told you this would happen. You put them together in the same school, I told you this would happen. The pressure was enormous on the president, on the dean, and on that small group of trustees. The pressure was enormous to end this experiment, lest it threaten the normal way of life, and even Joe Perkins began to waver. Until, and I heard this directly from the lips of his daughter, Elizabeth Perkins Prothro, until her mother, Lois Perkins, stepped into the situation and insisted that the desegregation of Southern Methodist University continue. You see, it only takes a few determined and dedicated people who see a vision of heaven where all of God's people will get beyond the great ordeal of life, and the transformation of the world will happen and will be celebrated in victory by bringing that vision of heaven down to earth. I say this because I believe the church is a living organism. It is the body of Christ. It lives by the grace of God and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit across the span of space and time. But so often we diminish the faith and demean the church by defining it in smaller or more manageable terms. People reduce the living faith and a living God through a living church by thinking in terms of what I believe what my church is doing. Too many times to count, I've heard people say things like this. The Bible that I read says, my local church is doing the God in whom I believe offers, the Jesus to whom I pray teaches, all of that language shrinks the power of the faith to what a mind can understand or what a heart can feel and to a culture that takes comfort in a particular style of living. But the church lives beyond and across all boundaries of space and time. It's so much bigger than my theology or your congregation or our denomination. We're just part of the victorious fellowship of saints. And even better, we belong to a community that will achieve victory, provided we do not insist on telling God that we would preferred to have our victories in smaller pieces. Focus on the big mission. Focus on the whole people of God. Focus even on the ones whom Jesus may have had in mind when he said to his disciples, other sheep I have who are not of this fold. Let's not tell the Lord what his business is. Let's have the Lord tell us what our business is. Next month, Naomi and I will be in Malaysia, where I've been invited to preach at John Wesley Methodist Church in Kuala Lumpur, and then to conduct a pastor's retreat in their conference. 
To be a Methodist in Malaysia is to face an assortment of challenges that we in North Texas and North America cannot fathom. To give you just one example, the leaders of the pastor's retreat that I'll be attending sent an email blast to all of the Methodist clergy about the schedule and the speaker and the other details of the gathering. Within the announcement was a disclaimer that the communication was intended solely for the people in the existing membership of the Methodist Church. Only those who are already within the existing established body are to receive the information about this retreat and to consider themselves invited to the conference. Why was that disclaimer included? Malaysia is officially a Muslim country. And by law, no religious sect or group is permitted to evangelize persons outside of their own membership. A church can operate without interference so long as it doesn't try to proselytize among persons beyond their own membership. I know of one Methodist church in Kuala Lumpur a few years ago that was hosting a dinner in its building for their members who were involved in a food pantry ministry. Someone had invited a guest who had been receiving food from the pantry to come and have dinner. The problem, as it turned out, is that she was not a Christian. During the dinner, a gang of thugs barged into the church. They had waited outside until they heard someone offer a prayer of thanks to precede the meal, and then they interpreted the prayer as an action evangelistically directed at their non-Christian guest. The thugs burst into the church wielding batons and clubs. They chased the people from the room, and they smashed the plates of food with their weapons. The thugs were arrested a couple of days later. And not long afterward, I learned that they belonged to a politically active group who are trying to push the civil authorities to be more aggressive in enforcing the laws against religious recruitment than the laws themselves in Malaysia actually require. The Methodists in Malaysia know that. Their country's laws do not prohibit Christians from gathering for worship or offering food to the community. And the Methodists know something else, too that offering grace before a meal is not nearly as effective an evangelistic act as giving food to the hungry. The distribution of food is the act of grace, the act of mercy, the act of testifying to the faith. So maybe the thugs did have a reason to be afraid Serving others may be the best way to tell the story of Christ. In the end, the victory belongs to those who have come through the great ordeal, because our salvation, our victory, is not by political or cultural power, but by the mercy of Christ. And we already know how to celebrate that victory. You might recall when the film Places in the Heart was released, it not only received rave reviews, but from some quarters it also received caustic critiques. The movie, as you probably recall, stars Sally Field and Danny Glover. It's set in the 1930s in Waxahachie. In the opening scenes, the plot lines are clearly set. Sally Field's character is married to the local sheriff who is summoned from his Sunday dinner to deal with a black teenager who has acquired two dangerous things, some alcohol and a loaded gun. Within minutes, the drunken teenager fires a random shot and kills the sheriff. Then a lynch mob forms and kills the black child and drags his body through the streets on a rope tied to the back of a pickup. Then the young widow takes in a border, a blind border, to try to collect some money for rent. And she also takes on a homeless black drifter in an effort to grow cotton 
so she can keep her home and family together. The homeless drifter leads the effort to bring in the cotton and get a good price for the bales, but in doing so, he offends a local group of clansmen who beat him within an inch of losing his life. None of that aroused the ire of the critics. What aroused the critics was the closing scene in the film. It takes place in the sanctuary of a local church. A congregation is gathered for worship. All the characters that you've seen in the film are there. At the conclusion of the service, there's a celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion. In the style of that congregation at that time, the trays of bread fragments and small cups are passed through the pews. One by one, people pass the trays and say with the trays of cups, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. And we watch as the homeless black drifter whose scars from the bad beating are all gone, they're healed, passes the elements to one of the men who may have beaten him. And the teenager whose drunken stray bullet killed the lawman passes the elements to the lawman whom he killed. The critics who complained apparently had never read the book of Revelation. They didn't know about our beliefs in the communion of the saints. They hadn't heard about the victory of those who have been through a great ordeal. They did not grasp that we are celebrating a sacrament of triumph when we take the bread and share the cup from the Lord's table. For all of God's people, more than any of us can number, are gathered from every tribe and nation and language and culture, and not a tear falls from an eye unless God is there to wipe it away. On a recent day in Perkins Chapel, one of my faculty colleagues was presiding at the Lord's table in a service of Holy Communion. As he extended the invitation, he said this, the saints are gathered in heaven, waiting for us to join them. And while they wait, he said, they're inviting us to meet with them in this manner here on earth, where we can enjoy the fruits of victory long before we feast at the heavenly banquet or sing the songs of angels. Across the boundaries of space and race and culture and time, we are gathering with the blessed people of the Lord. We are invited to celebrate our living faith in a living God through a living church in a dying world with a feast of praise and thanksgiving. That's what we're doing tonight. And I'm glad to welcome everyone to celebrate a mysterious and magnificent victory. Amen.